joined by Mira Jacob from the United States. She's the author of a critically acclaimed novel called The Sleepwalker's Guide to Dancing, which was a Barnes & Noble Discover New Writers pick and was also shortlisted for India's Tata First Literature Award and was honored by the Asian Pacific Librarians Association. And it was named one of the best books of 2014 by Kirkus Reviews, The Boston Globe, Goodreads, Bustle, and The Millions. Uh, I think that list goes on and on. Uh, Mira is also the co-founder of a much-loved Pete's reading series in Brooklyn, where she spent 13 years bringing literary fiction, non-fiction, and poetry to the city's sweetest stage. Uh, Mira currently teaches fiction at New York University. Mira, uh, great to have you on board LitFest X. Thanks for having me. So, um, Mira, you know, take us a little through uh, the main uh, story and character of uh, Amina uh, from your book. And, and then we can sort of yeah. proceed. Sure. Um, Amina is a, she, when you meet her, she is a failed photographer. She took a picture that has kind of derailed her life. And when you first enter the book, she's, um, she's being a wedding photographer. She's unfortunately unable to completely leave behind her journalistic eye, which that she captures a lot of the very awkward moments that happen at weddings. And, um, and she and her mother calls her to say, your father has been to the people that don't exist, um, that are we, I can't actually see, and you need to come home and figure out what this is about. And, um, you know, you mentioned that this one photograph completely sort of derailed her life. Um, you know, do you think that, you know, that, that sort of form of artistic expression, that one photograph, really became a, a bane for her primarily because you know uh, the society is not allowing uh, artists to express themselves easily or you know what is the what is the underlying yeah, uh, what is the underlying current there in the book yeah uh the underlying current so the picture that she takes is of a native american man uh bridge in seattle and there's a lot of backstory there, but basically there was a, the Puyallup settlement, which in which the tribe, the Tacoma tribe of Indians, um, settled and and sold some of their land for I think it's 138 million dollars. And in that moment, there was a lot of tumult within the tribe whether or not they were selling their heritage and their history and their um, inheritance of this land. And, and there were a future that was really untenable, which was just money. And um, that's an actual thing that happened uh, in America. The, the story of Bobby McLeod, who jumps off a bridge, who's the leader, who is one of the many leaders um, of these people, that's completely realized. Um, and what she is on a Microsoft boat, um, she's sort of taking pictures of a party, and this man steps to the bridge, off of it and she takes this picture of him suspended between the bridge and the water sort of before he he dies um, and it's that moment um, and it's in America I think there's sort of a great psychic moment that has happened for many um, non-white races where they feel that kind of peril of Americans certainly and she captures this um, and it destroys her because she goes on to make money from it. Um, she makes money from it because she owns the rights to the picture and because it is reprinted and because it becomes emblematic of something that Americans know about themselves and can't look at but can't look away and it puts it in front of them. And um, it becomes its own um, story, this photograph, but she's implicated by that. And the money she makes from that is implicated and her view, her gaze, is really implicated because um, it becomes a question of what kind of person takes this photograph. Mind you, this was in the 90s before digital cameras were absolutely everywhere and everyone would take pictures of everything. So there was an idea there about what you choose to photograph and 
and a kind of onus on that. And we've seen that, you know, with countless other photographers, but this is the way in which it intersects in her life. You know, um, you mentioned something about the immigrant sort of situation in the U.S. and, and how society, media, the press uh, write and think about immigrants from different parts of the world and how they are uh, settled in the U.S. You know, tell us a little bit yeah. about how you're dealing with those uh, issues in the book. Um, it's really, it's very ripe time for that discussion right now. Exactly. Um, exactly. In, yeah, we're, in a, we're in a very crazy political uh, moment. I spent last night watching the Republican National Convention and just cringing at what's happening to my country right now. Um, but in the book, um, there's the, the seeds of all of this are coming up. The idea that I think one of the things that happens a lot in America, and one of the things I addressed this publicly on my, publicly on my, was said to me a lot as a kid, um, was, uh, well, we as Indians came here, my people were Indians, um, we came here and we were very successful, there are people that can't be successful. And the people that say that ignore a very specific history that's happened in America, not only what happened to the Native Americans and the way that they were systematically erased from the land, but also the ways in which Africans were imported into this country as slaves when, frankly, Indians were brought in. Yes, we work hard and we're very smart and very um, good at what we do, but we're mainly brought in by a system of laws in the 1965 and 1990 that allowed them to thrive more I think when I'm talking about this specifically in the book, what I was aware of when I was growing up was that we were both called Indians where I grew up in, in New Mexico. We were both called Indians, but those Indians were left to barren plots of land to try to figure their way out of kind of a hole that they had been put in. And they had been left to language, not just left to language, but actively discouraged from being part of America in any way that took care of who they were and how they approached the world. Whereas my Indian was welcomed um, to an extent with open arms, doctors and engineers, and here's, you know, we want you to thrive here. And, and I was very aware of the, the difference that was going on um, between myself and the people that I was surrounded by, both of us being called Indians, the irony there. And so to what do you attribute that difference in treatment? That the difference in treatment? Yes. Well, one, I think the most obvious would be that the Native Americans land that various uh, Europeans wanted. So Indians were not, we did not have anything in possession um, that anybody wanted to take from us at a specific time. Um, that's what I attribute that to, that, that we were invited in at a time when it made economic sense um, to expand in that way in America. And I think we've done wonderfully here. And I'm very proud of what we have done here as a community. But I think it's a very different situation that we were brought into. And when people are unaware of that, it pains me. Absolutely. No, clearly, I think uh, Indians in America have you know, done uh, both countries proud, right? And there is no question about that. Um, you know, you've, sure. you've uh, sort of uh, focused on death in a very specific way, right? And um, so tell us about, you know, your treatment of, of death in the book. Sure. One of the things, I think, um, one of the things that makes sense a lot when I hear other writers talking about their work is you write the book that you need to see in the world. And when my father was dying, um, he, I was writing this book, just to give you a little backstory. I was writing this book for three years and I had another father character in there and I understood that he was going to develop something I thought was kind of a form of Alzheimer's. And, and kind of move away from his family, um, psychically, mentally. And what happened was three years into the book, my father, who was extremely healthy, was diagnosed with cancer and started the process of what I didn't know then was dying. 
um, because you carry a lot of hope in that moment uh, when someone's diagnosed and you and you feel that they can come back from it. And um, what I realized when I was going through the process of losing him was that nobody spoke, nobody wrote of it the way that I, I needed, um, which is with the, you know, you don't die in your family. The love doesn't die. Um, the weight of the world becomes significantly different um, and weighs on you in a very real way. Um, when I was, just to tell you what happened with the book, I stopped writing completely um, for about three years while my dad died. And um, when I think about how that felt, I sort of imagine myself my my psyche as um as this great big beautiful hotel rooms and many floors and all of these different avenues to explore as a writer I had all of these places to go but when he started dying big fiction and because it requires your heart to kind of hold a lot of emotions and go everywhere it's very hard to do that when you're holding on to hope and when we're really holding on to this this great hope that the person you love the most might live through an enormous amount of pain. Um, and what happened was I just started shutting down and I imagined the, um, I stopped being able to have the kind of breath that you have to have in fiction, the kind of expansiveness. Um, and when he, after he died, I ran for a while. And then when I went back to the book, um, I was a bit embarrassed because I went back to that father character and I kept trying to write him as he had been written before. And I had missed my own father so much that I kept writing my own father, which didn't make sense because the family is fictional. My mother is not, I'm nothing like that. My father, my brother, but the father kept, kept slipping into my father because I missed his hands and I missed his voice. And I missed the way that we would fight, frankly. Um, I missed how we would get in arguments and he would leave the room um, because that's not something you can do easily when someone's dying. Um, but when I started, started putting him in it, and it was a little bit like going back to that hotel and kind of flipping on the lights, um, just floor by floor, and remembering that there were parts in me that felt more um, than, than they did in the moments of his death. So I needed to write the book that sort of explained all of that. Um, that, that how, you know, kind of where you're in the moment of losing someone, but also how, how terribly dark and funny some of dying is um, and that sounds really callous when I say that but I say that with as much compassion as I can because I I really lost someone important to me I was not spared that I just really I I really feel like there was part of what was losing him was understanding the way in which uh, we learn we learn to laugh through it um, Wow I'm I'm actually uh a little speechless by what you've just said, um, Mira. But uh, clearly, you've you've taken that personal loss and and turned it into something different. You know, um, I, I'm sure a lot of people, of course, feel the same way for a loss of a dear one. But I think you've internalized it and thought through it so differently. Um, you know, so then when you write about death in your work um do you do you see that you know there is a certain amount of uh, of feeling that people can come back that the, that the soul is still around you know that sort of uh, i mean without, without that's a saying, great question that's a great question yeah you know what i'll tell you um one of the things that happened uh when you lose it doesn't happen like it does in the movies. There's not a kind of um, a beautiful moment there, and also it happens very quickly. You know, it just you, it's sort of they're there and then they're not. Even if you lose them slowly, somehow that moment feels quick because they were alive and then they're not. Um, and for me, uh, my father was a doctor, so he really right up to the door of his death, explaining every second of what was going to happen in this way that I can't. When I think about it, it still um, makes me tear up because I, I feel like it was such a generous thing to do. Um, and he did that, and then when he was gone, it was so surprising. It was so shocking that he was actually gone. 
So when I was writing this, you asked me, does it come back and does it turn things around? One of the funny things is that when I started writing again, I wrote the book for another four years. And I got to go back, I got to have new memories with him, <laughs> which is a really strange thing because I'm not the main character and that's not his family, but imagining how he would react gave me a strange world. It was a kind of flimsy and strange world that allowed um, a fair amount of healing and forgiveness because I felt like I was seeing his death out the way I wanted to as opposed to, to the way it happened, which I should say doesn't mean that it was like a, a brilliant movie like Death in the Book either. It was hard um, and I and I don't want to I don't want to overstate that it was some sort of beautiful um, happy thing that happened in the book. It was just as hard but I got to do it more slowly and I think that sometimes when you do that you are able to see all the angles around something that didn't occur to you at first. Does that make sense? Right, right. You know, um, in terms of your your next sort of piece of work, you know, tell us about what you're currently working on. Yeah. Um, so right now I am uh, drawing my ne next book. Um, I draw as well. A great friend who after this book sort of said to me, what's your next book? Which is what everyone asks and every author I know sort of freezes and panics. And uh, my friend, who's an architect, said, sometimes when I think of my creativity, I like to think of it as a topographical map and imagine where have I not been. And when he said that, I thought, oh, that makes sense. I should draw a book. Um, so I'm drawing a book. It's called Good Talk, Conversations I'm Still Confused By. Um, and there's a section of it online that's with my son. It's called um, 37 Difficult Questions from My Mixed Race Son. It's about my six-year-old son has an obsession with Michael Jackson. And uh, when this happened, he was looking at a Jackson album. So he said to me, um, Mommy, as this would occur to a six-year-old, um, is Michael Jackson brown or is he white? And I said, oh, well, that's a great, you know, actually he started brown and then he turned white. And he said, he turned white? And I said, yeah, um, uh, kind of. And then he said, wait, are you going to turn white? And I said, no, no, I'm not going to turn white. And he said, am I going to turn white? And I said, no, you're not going to turn white. And he said, is daddy? And I said, well, daddy's already white. And he said, well, was he always? Um, which is so funny because that's how a kid kind of internalizes race. And so what I'm doing is I'm drawing these conversations I mean, some of them are brutal um, but they're just the conversations that have formed my life uh, I think the term for what I'm just thinking of it as a collection of conversations that I can't stop thinking about it, it sounds very very interesting Mira and uh, I wish you all the luck uh, I, hope so. I wish you all the luck for uh, for the new book as well and uh, thank you so much for uh, you. you know being with us and uh, you know if I can say just speaking from the heart uh, you know uh, I, I know many times uh, you know uh, two people in a conversation need to be in the same room uh, but I, I think uh, just the way you spoke uh, I think we, we connected and I'm sure our viewers uh, will connect with you the same way so uh, congratulations and thank you so much Oh, thank you so much for having me. And thanks to all the viewers for tuning in.